Hey guys, welcome to this uh, video about transfer learning. And in fact, we did cover transfer learning as one of our previous videos, but I think it's worth talking about it again because I think you will gain a lot just by using pre-trained uh, deep neural network models. And of course, when I say that, by using the weights, the pre-trained weights, because all that knowledge that they have gained by training the systems for weeks and months, we can just leverage those weights and uh, apply that to our specific application. So also consider this as a follow up of my previous video number 158. Hence the reason I'm going to call this video 158B. In the video 158, we talked about using convolutional layers as feature extractors, except we haven't used the pre-trained weights, we just use the randomized weights. So we just put together four of these convolutional layers and then just said, okay, let's send our image information through these convolutional layers and then use the output as features and then feed it to random forest. Nothing wrong with that, except they're randomized weights. They're not pre-trained. But if someone spent a lot of time, especially smart people who put these things together like VGG16, if they spent like six months or so, training their, uh, uh, you know, this model on millions of images, we may as well use that information. So this video is about taking that and combining it with random forest or support vector machines. And that part, please don't put too much focus on random forest and support vector machines. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, just take it off and put your own deep learning uh, or neural network, actually. You can put a dense layer and an output layer. But again, this is a quick summary of transfer learning and we'll actually go through some code. But before doing that, let's just quickly remind ourselves what transfer learning is. I already summarized it. It is where you take one or more of these pre-trained layers, including the weights, and apply that onto a new model for a related problem. When I say related problem, if you're actually taking a model that has been trained on a whole bunch of audio for like speech recognition, you cannot apply that onto a image processing problem. But something like VGG16, where it's trained on a whole bunch of images, if you are doing image classification, that is a great model to, uh, uh, to perform or transfer learning. Now, uh, the example I just gave you, VGG16 has been trained over 10 million uh, images, so it already learned how to detect generic features, whether they're edges or roundedness or whatever those generic features are, it, it already knows how to detect them. So let's go ahead and leverage that. Also, this model can be downloaded as a feature extractor, meaning you download the weights, and then you combine with your own custom dense layers and output layer, or you can combine it with random forest if you have more trust on random forest. I do, random forest is much faster. Some people say it gets, uh, you can easily overfit, but I don't think that's true, at least uh, uh, based on my experience and also, if you're talking about decision trees, yes, you can overfit them, but Random Forest uh, has randomization as part of this. Again, please watch my tutorial about Random Forest, whether it comes to picking the features in a random way or splitting the nodes in a random way. Random Forest, I think, has uh, some built-in mechanism way of generalizing the problem. Of course, you can always overfit any model, but uh, anyway, so that's my 30-second, uh, you know, uh, speech about random forest. Now, uh, a few of the pre-trained models that are available, especially via Keras, are VGG16, VGG19, and Inception V3 ResNet50. So please go to Keras's, uh, you know, web page to get more information about other architectures. I personally like VGG16 because it works, at least on uh, most of the problems I worked with, it does a great job. Now, just to remind you what VGG16 is, it's a convolutional neural network, and as you can see, it has four blocks, or five blocks, I think, one, two, three, four, five, five convolutional blocks, and uh, after the final pooling, now you have the dense layers. So when you're importing this into Keras, into your uh, Python, typically you say, uh, do not import the top. And when they say top, that means dense layers, okay? Don't be confused. Maybe I should turn the image the other way around. So top is basically the dense layers, okay? So all of these, uh, it, it, and why is it famous? It actually got 93, about 93% 93 of accuracy in ImageNet, and ImageNet, I'll get to what ImageNet is in a second, but, uh, well, it says right here, a data set over 14 million images belonging to 1,000 classes. That's what it's uh, trained on. 
So it's amazing and it's trained for weeks using NVIDIA Titan Black GPUs. So even if we are poor and we cannot afford a whole bunch of these GPUs, fine, they did the work. We'll just take this and then we continue the work, yeah? And ImageNet itself is a data set of over 15 million. Just go to ImageNet, I don't know if it's .com or .org, Google search ImageNet, you'll find, the, you'll find the link and I'll see if I can find it and place it as part of the description. But it's a data set of over 15 million labeled high resolution images and they belong to about 22,000 categories. Okay, now let's jump into our code and continue the discussion. Now, first, I would like to start with video number 158. Again, we already covered this. I'm not going to go through every line here, but just to highlight what we have done earlier, we got, we defined our convolutional layers. We defined one, two, three, four convolutional layers with some batch normalization and max pooling. And we put this together and at the end of it, we are flattening it which means the weights that are assigned here are just random weights. There is no backpropagation. We are not, we are not training them over multiple epochs. So these weights are completely random initialized weights, which is still okay. I mean, the, the, these are still digital filters at the end of it. So they do work, but are they the appropriate filters? Probably not. Yeah, some of those filters just give you blank images, blank responses. Maybe they're not, not even good. Yeah, so that's why transfer learning comes into the picture. So what have we done there? We just took that and then this feature extractor part, we just applied to our training images, all of our training images. And then that gave us our X as input to our random forest, okay? So this is exactly what we have done in 158 and please go ahead and look at it now Let's assume, at least let me assume, that you haven't watched video 158 and you're just watching this. So let me explain a few things here, okay? Like I do in every video, I assume nothing. I assume every video is a video you're watching for the first time in my channel. So let's, uh, uh, which probably makes some of uh, this a bit painful for you guys, uh, but uh, reinforcement is not a bad thing when it comes to learning. Okay, so first let's imp uh, import our regular libraries right there, NumPy's and matplotlib. And from Keras, I'm importing our regular, uh, again, uh, layers like model, sequential, dense, and flatten. So we may not use all of those, but let's go ahead and uh, import all the way down to here. Seaborn, probably I'll use that for plotting, uh, especially the confusion matrix. It's, it makes it very visible. Now, this is the line I want you to uh, keep an eye on. From keras.applications.vgg16, I'm importing the uppercase VGG16. Okay, now go to the documentation at keras.applications and look at other stuff that they actually have there, other architectures. You may find something else better for your problem. So let's go ahead and run this line. We'll see how to use it in a minute. Now, before jumping into the model itself, let's look at the data. What are we trying to achieve here? We are trying to, let's go back to image. There are two folders here, train and validation. Under train, I have four folders, barn, dog park, landscape, and sunset. All of these images I just downloaded from Google search. So I'm not gonna share them. I don't own any rights. This is not my data. You can Google search, you can download your own data. So uh, I have about 70 images for training for each of this. Definitely not enough, right? I mean, typically for machine learning, you need thousands, if not millions of images like VZG did, but we'll get, I hope, above 90% accuracy on these, uh, or at least 90%. Uh, and, and we'll see that, yeah? And uh, I also have validation, not many images, like just five images in each of these. And these are the images that are not used as part of training, obviously. That's, that's the whole point of validation. So, and uh, my class labels are barn, dog park, landscape, and sunset, four classes. I don't have to classify my images under what VGG did or something else did because I'm just taking the transfer learning and then just creating my own, uh, my own classifier. Okay, so this is the problem. Now let's get in. So first of all, uh, again, one other point, VGG16 has been trained on images that are 224 by 224 by three as input. So the input to standard VGG would be 224 by 224 by three. So, but because we are doing this transfer learning using the convolutional layers, you do not have to resize your images to 224. You can work with 512 uh, resolution images if you want, if you have a high enough GPU or memory. And uh, you can even work with the 2K by 2K images. It's up to you. 
so just to demonstrate that point, I'm using 256 for my size. So you can see that things actually work. So 224 was the original VGG. Okay, and here all I'm doing is uh, a placeholder lists for my training images and training labels. And labels is basically the folder names, as you can see right there. My label is nothing but the directory name. Uh, and uh, for each image I'm reading, I'm attaching the directory name as a label. So go through this code. Again, this is uh, something we covered at least in a few of my previous tutorials. So again, like I said, I don't assume you watch them, but sometimes uh, I like to force you to watch them. So uh, please go ahead and look at that. Now, so I'm using uh, Glob to walk through these uh, individual files and all these images are JPEGs in this case. And again, I like scientific images in TIFF format. If nothing, PNG format. JPEG has its own issues, so try to stay away from them. But since I downloaded them from Google search, I that's okay. I'm working with JPEG. Okay, so I'm resizing these images into 256 by 256 okay because they go as input into my model and then i'm appending these image the pixel values or the image uh right there to my train images uh placeholder same with my labels okay so they after this uh, again let's go ahead and run these lines so you can see exactly what happens okay it's going through every image and if i open my train images here you see 320 by 256 by 256 by 3 so I have 320 total images. Each image is 256 by 256 by three. And train labels, I have 320 labels. And if I open this, uh, well, let's uh, let's not worry about this. Uh, I, this is a uh, it's a, this is an NDRA object, so I can call it and then look at it. But just believe me, that these 320 basically is uh, the folder names, yeah, sunset and so on. Okay. Now, these are all training. So let's do exactly the same for validation or testing, if you wanna call it, testing images, okay? Or you can dump all images into one folder and then just take 80% for training and 20% for testing. It's up to you how you want to divide this. But this is all just basically uh, the, the data handling part. Okay, so now I'm going to encode the labels from text to integers. What basically I'm trying to do here is my labels right now are sunset, dog park. So instead of that, I'm just converting them into to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's what this step is. So I'm doing that both for my training and testing labels, okay? So now if, I, if you see my train labels encoded, you should actually see the test labels. You should see 0, 1, 2, 3. So these are the four classes that I have. Same for the training labels, yeah? Ah, I keep opening this. Let's open the encoded. So Oh, some reason it has encountered an internal problem. Sorry about that. I can't show you that. But uh, anyway, just you can see that you have zero, one, two, three right there. Okay, so now that we have it, let's go ahead and split this into train and test for internal testing. And then we can do validation later. This step is optional because we already have the validation data uh, separate. Maybe I should remove this, but since I have it, let me go ahead and continue. Okay, now let's also normalize the pixel value because our values, uh, pixel values go from zero to 255. So just to make sure we scale them uh, accordingly, I call it normalized, but all I'm trying to do is scaling. So dividing each pixel value by 255, again, you probably know what we are doing here. So X train and X test, now we have X train and X test uh, as a floating point instead of integers. All set, one final step before we move on to our actual transfer learning part one hot encoding the y values because our y train for example y test is 0 1 2 3 right but this doesn't work very well for multi class problems all you need uh, you need one hot encoded meaning if i look at my zeroth row right there this should be zero but then you should also have entries for 1 2 3 4 if that doesn't make sense watch my video or just wait a few seconds to see how the output looks like for one hot encoded so let's open y test one hot encoded and here so here, uh, the original value is zero. So it puts a value of one saying that, hey, uh, this value is zero. Maybe a counterintuitive for you, but uh, all the values that are one here represent that, yes, it is zero. Think of one as true. Is it zero? True. Is it one? True for these values. Is it two? True for these values. Is it four? I mean, three? True for these values. And it's one hot encoded because if you look at a row, only one value is hot which is value of one. Okay, so, so far so good. Most of this stuff you probably already know. 
if you watched my previous videos. Now, let's actually go get down to defining a model. Typically, this is where we would define our model. If I go back, this is where we define our model, say model equals to sequential, add convolutional, blah, 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 all of that. Now, we are not doing that. We are basically saying my model, I called it VGG model, equals to VGG16, because we already imported it, if you remember, right? I mean this. And what do you want to do that? Download the weights for ImageNet, okay? And include top equals to false. What that means is do not, let me go back here, include the dense layers only up to the last pooling layer. We'll see that in a second, okay? That's exactly what include top equals to false means. And of course, you have to provide the input shape. And in this case, our shape is 256 by 256 by three. I hope you're okay so far. So let's go ahead and run this line. And the VCG model is imported. Now let's go ahead and actually, this is not a bad idea to look at the summary. So if I do, summarize this keep an eye on this okay you have input layer 256 by 256 by 3 and then all of these layers and in the convolutional layer how many trainable parameters 1792 in the next convolutional layer 36928 trainable parameters again i did a video on what trainable parameters means so please watch that so all of these and if you add all of those, total trainable parameters are 14,714,688. That's too many trainable parameters. And you need a lot of tremendous amount of data to actually get a very nice convergence on these type, which basically means let's not do that. VGG people already did it. They actually trained it, so we have the weights. So how do we tell the system that these are not trainable? Well, let's remove this summary line right there and look at this line right here you can actually say okay uh, my block one convo one is not trainable block one uh, block two con one is not trainable but then the next one is trainable you can pick which ones you want to be trainable but if you don't want any of those trainable which is the case in our experiment right here because we are trying to use this as feature generators so we want all the weights intact so I just wrote a small for loop where it goes through each layer in this model.layers and then sets this trainable equal to false. So once I run this, and now let's look at the summary, the same summary again, it should still show the same number of parameters right there, right? Because each layer comes with certain number of parameters, but are they trainable? Hopefully it should say none trainable parameters zero. That means we are not training it as we go through multiple epochs, for example, okay? So it's going to, the weights are constant. So this is how you define a feature extractor when you import, you know, something that's already been trained. And in this case, we are importing VGG16, but this can be your own model that you trained. Okay, on a whole bunch of images. It doesn't matter. When you import it, just make sure that you're importing the weights and then you're setting your trainable layers as false. After this, we have our features and we just need to send our input data through this feature extractor and then train a random forest. How do we do that? Well, now I uh, am assigning something called feature extractor, which is basically take this VGG model and then predict it on what? On our X train. Remember, we already separated X train, X test, Y train, and Y test. So just send your x train input, which would be 256 by 256 by three, uh, into through this, uh, well, not just 256 by 256 by three, it is 320 by 256 by 256 by three, 320 number of images, yeah? So that's what this represents, how many ever and this. So there you go. So now let's go ahead and do that. I'm not sure how slow that is going to be. I have a habit of not testing things before recording videos, so hopefully this will this will do the job. We'll see. Okay, so let's give it, I mean, that's a tremendous amount of data, so let's go ahead and give it a few seconds. So let me pause this video and then continue after the training, okay? Uh, which should be a few seconds, but why stare at the screen? Okay, that was not too long. That literally happened five seconds after I said, I'm gonna pause the video. So there you go. So we have my uh, our feature extractor, but then uh, that's just, that's just uh, 
you know, uh, does it even show up here? Yeah. So you can see that the feature extractor is of shape 320 by 8 by 8 by 512. It's no surprise because we know that after the final pooling layer, the shape is going to be how many ever images and 8 by 8 by 512. So instead of doing uh, 8 by 8 by 512 or random forest expects like one, uh, one column. So let's actually reshape this. So is that what I'm doing next? Yeah. So we are reshaping this into 320 by how many ever. Yeah. So let's go ahead and do that. And our features. I call that feature. So our feature shape is 320 by 32,768. This is what that goes into my random forest. So I'm, I'm just reassigning it to something called X for a random forest. That's because I'm reusing code from the last time and I don't want to change every parameter name. So this is just a minor detail there. Okay, now getting to random forest. I like the one that's available in scikit-learn ensemble. I think there is one other location, but uh, please remember to get random forest classifier because this is a classifier problem and not a regression problem. So let's run that line. And how are we defining? Let's actually put number of estimators as uh, number of trees, let's say. 50 is fine. Uh, random forest is pretty fast compared to other techniques. So there you go. By the way, at this point, this could be support vector machines or uh, logistic regression. It doesn't matter. This is just a classifier now. Okay. So now we defined our model. Let's go ahead and fit that onto our X for random forest and then Y train, right? I mean, our X and Y values. So let's go ahead and run this. You see how fast that was actually? So that was pretty quick. And uh, now let's go ahead and test it. Now, how do we test this? We have to do exactly the same thing that we did for our training data onto our testing data, which is we have to predict the features using VGG model. Remember, our VGG model is nothing but our feature extractor. So let's go ahead and predict it on test images, which is only 20 images. So I hope this is much faster. There you go. And then we are reshaping it just like we did our training images. And then we are predicting it. So our prediction random forest onto our test features, right? Onto our test features, we just predicted. And then uh, let's do inverse transform. When you look at the prediction random forest, where is it? Just a second, let me find it. Uh, prediction random forest, right there. You see the values are 0, 0, 2, 0, 0. That's obviously a misclassification there. 1, 1, 1, and 2, and so on. That doesn't mean anything to us. So let's apply inverse transform. What do we mean by that? We applied a transform up here. Remember, we converted our, if I can find it, we converted our labels. We encoded them. Initially, it was barn and sunset. Now we encoded them to 0, 1, 2. Let's get back. So that's exactly what we are doing when we do inverse transform. So hopefully, when you see prediction random forest, it's an ND array object. OK, so we did that. And uh, let's go ahead and look at overall accuracy. I hope it's above 90% or well, exactly 90%, 0.9 accuracy. That's pretty good, actually, given the limited amount of uh, uh, images we have used. And again, how did I calculate accuracy? This should be pretty straightforward for you, right? I mean, accuracy score and your original labels versus the predicted labels, OK? And uh, let's predict the, let's print out the confusion matrix and. Uh, and then uh, print it out, okay? Let's calculate the confusion matrix and print it out. And confusion matrix is basically visually showing us all five of five of these images with the label one are correctly identified as label one. Same with label three. Label zero and label two, apparently they got one wrong of all. So I wish I had a lot more images to test this, but hopefully you got the point there. And let's randomly, so all I'm trying to do here is randomly generate a number between zero and the number of test samples I have, which is 20, and then just load an image and apply the prediction just to see if the prediction is correct or wrong. So let's go ahead and run this a couple of times. So obviously there are some dogs. It says the prediction is dog park and the actual label is dog park. I don't know which ones it's getting wrong. Let's see. It says prediction is landscape. The original image is labeled as landscape. Oh, this is the one it got wrong. So uh, our prediction is landscape, but it is, I don't know why it got wrong. I can clearly see the barn over there, but oh well. And uh, barn is barn, barn is barn. Dog park is landscape. So it, it's coming, uh, it's 
calling this dog park, but, but if you look at the actual images, the dog parks and landscapes, it can be easily confused. But anyway, so we got about 90% accuracy using this, and if we had a lot more images for you know, our training purposes here, I'm pretty sure we would have gotten slightly better uh, accuracies. So I hope, uh, again, you learned something new, and I hope you found this tutorial to be useful. And before you try to find millions of images for training, unless you're working on an absolutely new problem like detecting glaucoma, you know, or something, even then, give transfer learning a try, because why relearn something that we have already learned? So uh, try VGG16 or try others. And if you have any success or failures, leave that as part of the comments. Hopefully I'll find time to answer your questions. If not, others who are much smarter than me can probably also answer these questions. So thank you very much.